What is an authorial agreement? An easy example is any contract that you ever had to sign. Now, the only input you give in um, a contract, say for some business service or public facility, is your signature. Is that you agree to specific terms in the contract, whereas the entirety of this written document, written or spoken document, is authored entirely by the the authority, the authority figure, which is the business owner or, or whomever you choose to so-called agree to engage with. You agree by their terms. And such is the way, but when I consider the basics of, of human existence, of being a human animal, there is, well, there is a need, there is a desire, for myself anyway, to redefine this basis because we don't have a clear definition, or rather the official definition and presumptions of what it means to be a human entails. It's, it needs revision, it needs, that's actually a very good term, revision, revision, we need to see, no, you, I ask you to see the human animal in a different perspective than what is um, widely and commonly accepted. For example, consider this, consider this basic f new fundamental aspect of humanity and that is the, the, fun, the fundamentals of freedom. Now, it's not even so much in an ideal sense. It is, it is very practical to consider that every human animal is free. That we are only equal in our freedom. But you only have this freedom for yourself. Now, a non-authorial agreement would simply be that, perhaps, you declare not the other person's behavior. You no longer tell people what you expect them to do when they're around you, for instance. Oh, if you're going to hang out with me, if you're going to come into my house, I expect you to take off your shoes if you come into my house. I expect you to tidy your own dishes if you get them dirty, um, whatever. I expect you to excuse yourself from the table if you need to fart, okay? We are so used to that in a sense of ownership and okay, if you want to deal with that in your own house, that's fine, but um, as a terms, in terms of how people behave, you can make no declaration of expectation for anyone else. All you can do is announce, declare how you behave. How do you behave? Now this declaration doesn't have to be necessarily explicit because when you're, you're interacting with somebody, especially a stranger, a new friend, there is an element and even with older friends, there's an element of discovery. That you discover how the person behaves through observation, through the time you spend with them. You don't necessarily know right off the bat all of the nuances of how a person behaves, whether they, um, say, cover their mouth when they cough. Okay, that's just a silly little example. Like, how how is their temperament? Do they get easily agitated when you um, accidentally misplace their their pens 
or when you um... leave the kitchen a mess, how how are they going to behave? Or um, say if you're in a loving relationship and um, say say you're the woman and uh, you come home or you go to hang out with your sweetheart and you're visibly tired and um, you don't necessarily tell them that you expect them to be accommodating and tender towards you. Um, what's all, what is that? What's a good word for that? To be warm and, and homemaking, to offer, say, a massage for your honey, to offer a massage. Well, they may do that or not, and that's part of the discovery process, is you, you want to discover how that person is going to pave all on their own without you necessarily having to prompt them. There again is the, uh, the non-prompting aspect of uh, the question of Parseval when he goes to the Grail Castle. Um, they anticipate that he is to ask a question but the the grail keepers the members of the grail family do not prompt him to this question they do not prompt parsival to answer this question likewise if you really want to discover the true behavior of a person is it necessary to prompt them or will you necessarily get true results if you're prompting their behavior oh i expect you to behave like this I expect you to be 100% transparent with me. I expect you to be tolerant with my temper. I expect you to uh, notify me of this and that or act like a civil person. How about this instead? You simply declare, and with brief language, what you do and do not tolerate. I mean, that's fair enough to, to draw the line, to give them at least that much of warning that, um, say for instance of uh, the Nahual, John Lam Lash, who's training an apprentice or, or whatever, okay? You can tell them just how far you'll tolerate or what you absolutely do not tolerate. Hmm. How would you phrase that, though? Well, you could say, for example, if you're dealing with a dude, you can say, even with a woman, you can say, I, I don't tolerate liars. I don't tolerate the act of lying or concealing or withholding. And if I detect that you are withholding anything from me or that you have lied to me about anything, then I will become intolerant. Those are the propositions of a non-authorial agreement. There is no contract to sign. There is no uh, terms of use that you might see when you sign up for an email account or for a website, a terms of use. Oh, if you want to use this website, then you are going to behave like this and, and everything you contribute to this website is the property of the website and so on and so forth. Well, back to the fundamental principle of freedom. The thing is, I'm starting to see that everyone is free. I mean, you, who can fucking deny it? Who can deny that, at least in terms of a choice, at least in terms of choice and um, selection, that everyone, every human animal is free to choose how to behave. Now, the other fact that the choices of behavior, especially when it comes to conformity, and the widespread conformity of the masses selecting into um, typical behaviors of how an obedient citizen behaves, yes, they do 
freely or seemingly freely select to, to behave as a model citizen. But yes, that, that model for behavior is manufactured by someone else. So you may argue that that's not really free, you know, you may argue that the zombies, those of the zombie horde, aren't really free. Well, at some point in, in their whatever, some point in their awareness, there are decisions, they are, there are decisions that they make. It's that they choose to repeat, say, um, the hab their own habits of decision. What does it mean to um, to get drunk or to get wasted or to waste away in front of a television set as many zombies will choose to do? Now, what does that mean? Because that means they're choosing to ignore the painful facts of life or the, 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 the ugliness of life. Yet it is a choice. I start to imagine that in the beauty to come, or I have imagined before, that in the beauty to come, you don't necessarily want to associate with people that, that cannot handle their own freedom. How is uh, how is an occultist like a CIA agent? Well, neither of them like to be followed, and this is even true of um, perhaps of a sovereign individual, of a sovereign man, of a sovereign man, or of a sovereign woman. As a sovereign man, I don't merely want to be followed. I don't merely want to be. Heritated. I don't merely want somebody to mimic my behavior because they aren't demonstrating their own capacity, they're not demonstrating their own intellect. <laughs> to be able to choose their own behavior. Come here, Tucker. Come on, boy. Come here, doctor. Come on, puppy. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Now, I don't want to be in a society where people behave like zombies. And it's not good enough just to have a model of behavior of which everyone copies after. That's not what makes a beautiful society of human animals. Although there is some aspect of mimicry, yes. But the true human animal cannot lack the cognitive capacity, the intellectual capacities to formulate their own codes of behavior which are acceptable to the rest of the tribe. This is possible. This is possible and it's not just possible, it, you see it. To some degree you do see this happen. <clears throat> so what does it mean when um, when a teacher comes to, no, when a student comes to a teacher, okay, does, is the teacher in the role of an authority figure and the teacher is going to lay down the law and say, 
this is how you behave. And you're going to act, you're going to perform, you're going to do performance A, you're going to do performance B, and you're going to do performance C, and if you do not, there will be consequences. Rather, in a, true, in a true learning situation, it is up to both the teacher and the student to discover how to adjust one's behavior and how to gauge each other's behavior for one another. The student observes the teacher. The student observes the temperament of the teacher. Likewise, the teacher is observing the temperament of the student without making expectations, without putting forth ultimatums. And um, whether it turns out that, that this particular coupling, this particular arrangement works or not is for the both of them to decide. And this is how it goes in a loving relationship, right? Hell, this even applies to a parent and child relationship. I mean, a parent is in a tough situation, mind you, yeah. But it's not uncommon that the, the child decides that it's not working out. It's very, it's not uncommon. Children, whether they are able to or not in every case, in some cases they do seek emancipation from the authority of their parents because it proves in many situations, not every, not every single situation, but in many, overwhelmingly many situations that the parent is indeed not helping the child and is in fact bringing hindrance to the child and blocking the child and preventing their growth and development. That does not help. <sighs> I mean, there's a difference, of course, between children and adults. Yes. But even a child can run away from home. Even an adult, an adult can run away from a child. A mother <laughs> I don't need to tell you that it's possible for a mother to uh, abandon her children because this is happening. This happens every day. Whether you know people like this or not, you probably do. You probably know many mothers and fathers who have abandoned their children. And, and on the flip side, is it absurd that children abandon their parents? Now that's another, another area of discussion. But I feel like it would work out better if parents could declare with the proper syntax. I'm, I'm not providing necessarily the pristine syntax here and now, but there could be syntax to provide to the child once they reach a certain age. Hey, you have sovereignty. You have freedom. You can do whatever you like. However, you you know by now, this is what I tolerate, this is what I offer, and if you should do so, something that I find intolerable, then you may not have me available. That's just, that's the only thing that you can really... That's the only thing that's really on the table is whether or not you're available for the other person, be it, a, be it a child or be it a lover or just a friend, even a friend. Even friends can say to one another, you know, uh, yeah, I can come up with clear, clear examples. Like, I don't accept if overeating as, as a depression coping mechanism. I don't accept obesity and eating junk food, not just junk food, but massive amounts of junky fast food and being severely overweight and unable to 
incapable of, of walking down the street without gasping for air. I don't tolerate that. All right? You can tell this to your friends, and it might be harsh, but I mean, this doesn't apply to me, so by all... Aren't I... I have no hypocrisy to say that to someone. I mean, I can still choose to be their friend. I don't necessarily have to. There could be other things that I don't tolerate. Um, I don't tolerate righteous behavior about people's beliefs or what people expect to be treated like with respect or whatever. Uh, <laughs> and it, when it comes to a point of uh, non-tolerance, then I just simply become unavailable. And that's all you can do to anyone. You can't take anything, you cannot take anything away from anyone but yourself. And mind you, they have all the freedom in the world to take themselves away from you. In a non-authorial agreement, you have two sovereign individuals dealing face to face with one another with no third party, no righteous third party to declare what's acceptable and what's not, what's unacceptable for the both of them. Sovereign individuals decide this at every given moment. You decide what is acceptable behavior. And um, you can be open about it. You, you be transparent about it. Look, this is the way I'm behaving. I find it acceptable to do this. I find it acceptable to uh, fart whenever the need arises. Whenever the need arises, without announcing beforehand, for example. Now you might not find that acceptable, and guess what? You don't have to grace me with your presence. In that case, we don't have to draw up an agreement where I'm going to hold in my farts for you. Or try to burp quietly for you. You can tell me, you, it's better perhaps, that you tell me right off the bat that, that <laughs> that's where you draw the line and we can um, move quicker to where we need to be, so to speak.